This is Ham College, episode 110, for March 1st, 2024. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Put a spring in your step with ICOM. Get outside this spring and work out the kinks in your station. ICOM has the radio for you. Good evening. Welcome to another Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we are back with some moderately eh, moderately tough questions tonight. Great. Not super tough. A sad note here we we want to mention before we get started. Uh, This is about a good friend of, of the show and probably most of the people watching. This comes from the Heil Ham Radio Facebook group. Our beloved founder, Bob Heil, K9EID, is now a silent key. Bob fought a valiant year-long battle with cancer and passed peacefully surrounded by his family. Bob's lifelong passion for amateur radio was clear to everyone involved in the hobby. Everything Bob did for the betterment and growth of amateur radio, from his instructional handbooks and countless presentations to his support of the ARRL and youth programs was based on the foundation and spirit of service. Bob was an Elmer to all of us. While Bob's presence will dearly be missed, his impact on the hobby and everyone in it will forever be felt. On behalf of Bob to all ham radio operators worldwide, 73. 73, Bob. Yep, 73, Bob. You'll be missed. Definitely. Wore my Ohio Sound shirt to celebrate Bob tonight. You, yep. Yeah. You now we've got our uh, Hall microphones, which are um, truly good sounding microphones. I'm not just saying that because Bob uh, has been a good friend for a number of years. Um, I really do like the way they sound. Now, if I just had a voice to put into them, it wasn't <laughs> hoarse most of the time. That's my problem. What did we talk about last time? Do you recall? Let me think about that for just a minute. I think it might have been about uh, matching, maybe matching antennas to feed lines, phasing lines, and power dividers. Seems kind of familiar. That that does. This month, what do you say we talk about transmission lines, characteristics of open and shorted feed lines, coax versus open wire, velocity factor, and electrical length, and coax cable dielectrics. Well, that would be the natural progression from last week, so we should do that. I was going to suggest it. Well, (laughs) well, I see we're on the same track. For the track we're on. I don't remember, as (laughs) always, who took the last one. It doesn't really matter. The first one. Well, flip a coin. Heads. Heads, okay. What does that mean? That means uh, I'll take the first question. What is the velocity factor? Of a transmission line. A, the ratio of the characteristic impedance of the line to the terminating impedance. Or B, the index of shielding for coaxial cable. C, the velocity of the wave in the transmission line multiplied by the velocity of light in a vacuum. Or D, the velocity of the wave in the transmission line divided by the velocity of light in a vacuum. Uh, it's not A, the ratio of characteristic impedance. And it's not B, the index of shielding. I know it's got to do with the the speed that uh, basically the current travels through the conductor. So it's got to be C or D, the velocity of the wave in the transmission line multiplied by the velocity of light in a vacuum. Multiplied. That'd be a huge number. Uh, velocity of the wave in the transmission line divided by the velocity of light divided by. I'm gonna go with D. That seems to be the one that makes the most sense to me. That's what everybody in the chat room is saying. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, that would be a huge number if it was. Yeah. <laughs> C. Well, there you go. Off to a good start tonight. Dodge one buzzer so far. Go me. (laughs) Let's see how this one works out for me. 
Which of the following has the biggest effect on the velocity factor of a transmission line? A, the termination impedance. B, the line length. C, dielectric materials used in the line. Or D, the center conductor resistivity. A, the termination impedance. Now, that won't have any effect on the velocity factor. B, the line length. Now, that, that doesn't affect the velocity factor. D, the center conductor resistivity. Now, it's uh, C, dielectric material used in the line. It looks like we have a consensus with... Uh, between us and the chat room here. And it is C. Wow. Look at that. You go, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I didn't, you didn't even see it coming, did you? <laughs> I did not see it coming. <laughs> I can tell you that is the honest truth. Well, I got something to say about that. <laughs> okay. Well, that should be good. We're going <laughs> to just briefly talk about the difference between a solid polyethylene dielectric coax and a foamed fill dielectric coax as well. Both of them are polyethylene, the top one, the, the uh, solid one there. Uh, the foam dielectric has air bubbles in the polyethylene. Like foam? Like foam. And it just so happens that these two cables, uh, the top one is a solid center conductor. The bottom one is a stranded, but that that doesn't have any effect here. It's all about that dielectric material. The velocity factor of the solid polyethylene is 66%. The velocity factor of the foam dielectric is 80%. And why do you think that would be? They're both polyethylene. Francis answered it. There's air in the foam. The velocity factor on a solid dielectric is going to be slower because there's a solid material between the center conductor and the shield. But on the foam dielectric, there's air bubbles in there as well, so there's mm -hmm. not as much insulated material between the two. So that increases the velocity factor because there's not as much in there. You know, if we had like a, a piece of ladder line, it's two lines, there's a, a gap separating them, and then every so often, you know, there's a square cut out. Mm, and window. so, yeah, where the windows cut out, that's an air dielectric because there's nothing there. And then every so often, you know, there's a, some plastic there and then another air gap. And they do that to um, lower the loss. And it also changes the velocity factor because I don't want to give too much away, but... Um, Go ahead and give it away. Yeah, no, nah, we'll give it away later. There's, there's air in that foam dielectric, and that's why it has a higher velocity factor. Okay. So that's about all I can say about that without giving it away. Why is the physical length of a coaxial cable transmission line shorter than its electrical length? A, skin effect is less pronounced in a coaxial cable. B, the characteristic impedance is higher on a parallel feed line. C, the surge impedance is higher in a parallel feed line. Or D, electrical signals move more slowly in a coaxial cable than in air. Why is physical length of coax cable transmission line shorter? The physical length is shorter than the electrical length. The skin effect is less pronounced... Coaxial cable. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think that probably matters. Uh, the characteristic impedance is higher in a parallel feed line, but it says coaxial cable in the question, not parallel feed line. Same thing for C. So it's got to be A or D. It is not A. Electrical signals move more slowly in a coaxial cable than in the air. And that's, that's true. It's, it's got to be D. Okay. That's what the chat room is saying. And I agree. 
And it is. Dodged one more buzzer. One more. It's my lucky night. <laughs> what impedance does a half-wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? A, very high impedance. B, very low impedance. C, the same as the characteristic impedance of the line. D, the same as the output impedance of the generator. What impedance does a half wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? So I've got a half wavelength of cable shorted at the end. A, very high impedance. No. C, the same as the characteristic impedance. No. D, the same as the output impedance of the generator. I'm going to say it's B, very low impedance. I would think I would think it's B, too. Chat room is saying it's B. Well, I got a chance. Soon. And it is. So, what is the approximate physical length of a solid polyethylene dielectric coax transmission line that is electrically one quarter wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz? A, 10.6 meters. B, 5.3 meters. C, 4.3 meters. Or D, 3.5 meters. Uh, how do you want to try to figure this out? I multiply. I multiplied uh, the fourteen point one times point two five, which was quarter wavelength, which I'm sure is wrong, but I, I don't know the formula. Okay, it came to three point five in a fraction. That's why I picked D. Well, if it ends up being that, you're a very lucky fellow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way you. The way you, <laughs> you figured, figured it wasn't right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they do put some perfectly wrong answers in here for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> the way you figure this out is you take 300 and you divide that by the frequency in megahertz, which is 14.1. Then we multiply that by the velocity factor. And this was a, uh, what was this, a solid dielectric. So the velocity factor for the solid dielectric. 66. Point, is 66. Wasn't it? Yep, percent. So we've got to convert that 66% to a number, which would be 0.66, because you move your decimal two places to the left to convert a percentage into a number we'll use in the formula here. That says 14.04. That's not even one of the answers. And, you know, we left out a step. That would be a, a full wavelength right there. <clears throat> yeah, we want a quarter wave. Yep. So we divide it by 4, 3.51. You sure did a lot of work to get to the same answer I had. <laughs> I did, didn't I, man? You're just that good. You got to, yeah, you're the <laughs> <laughs> luckiest man uh, I'm going to stop tonight. by a lottery ticket on the way home tonight. As uh, Spock would say, that was <laughs> totally illogical. But it worked. But it, well, yeah, maybe it worked. I got a 25% got, chance of getting it right. That's true. But it's funny that it fell close enough on it to the money. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think I would use that method on the next one that comes up. Okay. Because... Uh, yeah, you didn't even think about the dielectric. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, what did the chat room say? Um, a little mixed on that one. I can see why. We were a little did, mixed here. I, I, on it too. I did it like that for the class clown factor. It worked for you. Somehow. <laughs> Somehow. What is the approximate physical length of an air insulated parallel conductor transmission line? As electrically half wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz. A, 7 meters. B, 8.5 meters. C, 10.6 meters. Or D, 13.3 meters. What is the approximate physical length of an air insulated parallel conductor transmission line 
that is electrically one half wavelength long at 14.1 megahertz. So it's the same frequency as the last question, but it's a half wavelength instead of a quarter wavelength, and it's an air insulated. Yeah. So what's the velocity conductor. factor for air insulated? We um, didn't say that we didn't cover that. We didn't, did we? You have to know that going into the test. You mean you have to study? You, as hard as it may be to believe, uh, it would help. Unless you got your luck. Um, 0. 0.95. 0. 0.95 for air insulated parallel conductors. So let's see if that logic works out. Bring out the calculator and clear out the answers there. All right, so uh, I'm going to say 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz, which was 14.1. That gives us that number Time, now. Times 0.95 times 0.95 gives and, us that and it's and was it a half wave half wave length half of that half of that divided by 2 10.1 so let's see <laughs> if that is one of our choices I'm sorry 10.1 is not 10.6 is the closest one there so i'm going to say it is c 10.6 uh, mm, chat room's mostly saying C, but it is a little mix there. And the, yeah, the velocity factor of the open line is the uh, is a little questionable. It's, apparently, it's not exactly 0. 0.95 as I said, but close I got close enough. I think it's 10.6. Let's find out if it's C. And it is. Here are, are twin leads or parallel wires. Regular old twin lead at the top there, that's 300 ohm television antenna wire. Yeah. It has a velocity factor of 80. And you notice that we've got uh, a solid dielectric the whole length of the line. Next down is a ladder line. The wires are a little further apart. And you see there's a window cut every so often. So it varies between um, air dielectric and a solid dielectric. Makes the velocity factor 91%. And then open wire, you can see that's just two wires with an insulator every so often to keep equally spaced. That gives you a velocity factor of 95%. And that's because there's more air dielectric there. That's not all the types there are, but that's the, the ones we're most likely to run into as uh, amateur radio operators. And I don't remember the impedance of the open wire line. I want to say it's around 600 ohms. And the ladder line impedance... 300? I think it's around 450. Of course, the twin lead is 300. Okay, I knew one of them was 300. It's been a long yeah. time. I've run a lot of that twin lead back when I was a kid, but it's been... A Many years ago. That, yeah, that's what we all did. I mean, that's that's what everybody used for uh, for line back then. Talking about transmission lines, if a transmission line is any integer multiple of a half wavelength, the impedance will be the same at both ends. Hmm. It's a half wavelength long. That's a half wavelength. The impedance is going to be the same at both ends. Doesn't matter how many half wavelengths are involved, or what the terminating impedance is, or what the impedance of the line is, each half wavelength along the line, the impedance will repeat. So every half wavelength, the impedance is going to be the same, yeah. regardless of the load or the. I, the I did impedance. not know that. I didn't either till I looked it up. That's interesting. If the termination impedance is a short, an impedance meter will read a short every half wavelength. The same rule applies to open circuit terminations for a half wavelength cable. Mm. 
So that'd be a good good thing to keep in mind right here. Mm -hmm. If a transmission line is an odd multiple of a quarter wavelength long, the impedance at one end is the opposite of the other end. So let's say this is a quarter wavelength long. If it's uh, shorted at this end, it's going to be right the opposite at this end. It's going to be open. So where for a half wavelength, the impedance is the same every half wavelength. For okay. a quarter wavelength, if, and this is the if, if it's an odd multiple of a quarter wavelength, then it's going to be the opposite. Every odd multiple. So that would mean um, at one quarter wavelength, at three quarters wavelength, at one and a quarter wavelength, every odd multiple of a quarter wavelength. If the terminating impedance is an open, the impedance one quarter wavelength away will be a short. And this repeats every odd quarter wavelength. Well, what do you we say? I got a funny feeling we're going to put that to practice here in a few minutes. You know, there's a chance we could. And so it, that was <laughs> a good place. It's just a random topic. Yeah, that was a good place to put it, I think. What do you say we take a quick break? Give something away? Give some, yeah, come right back, give something away, and do some more questions. Sounds good. Put a spring in your step with ICOM. Get outside this spring and work out the kinks in your station. Fixing ice damaged HF antennas, preparing for an upcoming VHF contest, or portable operations, ICOM has the radio for you. Upgrade your station with one of ICOM's fabulous HF radios with the IC7610. Faint signals are no longer challenging for DXers and contesters. The high-performance RMDR can pick out the faintest of signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. This is the SDR every ham wants. With ICOM's IC905, VHF contesting is a breeze. This all-mode rig covers five bands with one radio. 2 meters, 70 centimeters, 1.2 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.6 gigahertz bands, and with the optional CX10G transverter, 10 gigahertz. Large color touchscreen, easy D-Star settings, and a separate controller and RF module configuration to reduce signal loss. Explore the world of microwave with the IC905. The IC705 and IC7300 are the perfect go-to rigs for outdoor hams who love POTA and SOTA activations. Both radios feature a large touchscreen with real-time spectrum scope and waterfall for intuitive function and setting operations. The IC705 provides base station features and performance in the palm of your hand from HF to 50, 144, and 440 MHz. The IC7300 is an industry first, using RF direct sampling and an entry-level HF radio. If you're getting a head start on hurricane season, ICOM's IC7100, ID5100, ID50, or ID52 are the perfect traveling companions and should be on your go-kit list. From high-powered base stations to compact and travel-friendly handhelds, ICOM radios offer in-demand features and functions to keep you active on all bands, inside your shack, or out in the field. For more information about ICOM's amateur radios, visit icomamerica.com amateur today. You got something to give away here? Got this shirt. It's a really cool shirt, actually. The ICOM Ham Crew T-shirt. It's got Ham Crew and ICOM on the front and on the back. If you would like to win that, all you got to do is send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. And we're going to select a winner from a random drawing, like right now, because I forgot to do it before yeah, the show. This is courtesy of ICOM America, by the way. I'm sure it's probably pretty obvious, but thanks to them for sponsoring this. They've uh, sponsored to every one of the shows we've been on so far for Ham College, haven't they? They have. <clears throat> if uh, if you don't know how to enter the contest for the drawings, you could win the cool ICOM 
a ham cruise t-shirt if i can say it you can send an email to ham college at amateurlogic.tv you don't need a license or anything you just need a name um, if you want to put a note in there that's cool we'd like to read them but uh, it's not required Every time we do the drawing, the queue gets cleared out and deleted. We, don't, we do not harvest your email address. No one else gets it. It goes straight into the bit bucket. And Dev no. I'm drawing a random number right now. Marcus Benjamin. There you go, Marcus. K-E-0-F-E-I. Sent from my iPhone 15 Pro Max. So Congratulations, Marcus. Marcus Benjamin, you say? Marcus Benjamin, K E zero F E I. How does ladder line compare to small diameter coaxial cables such as RG fifty eight at fifty megahertz? A lower loss. B higher SWR. C smaller reflection coefficient. Or D lower velocity factor. Uh, it's got a higher velocity factor. I, I, I'll just, I think I know this one already. I'm just not even going to go, like, run through them because I think it's A, lower loss. And that's that's pretty amazing to me because just the design of it doesn't seem like it should be. But I know uh, ladder line is typically lower loss than coax cable. It is. It just doesn't seem like it should be either, but it, it is. Yeah, I guess, unless you consider that there's more air gapping in there um, between the two conductors. Probably some other factors as well. Everybody's saying A in the chat room over here. A? A. That's Canadian night. That is. There you go. All right. Lower loss. This wasn't absolutely necessary that we looked at, but I just wanted to pull it up because it's interesting. It might give away some of the other answers, but... But hold on, let me take a picture of that with my phone. Hmm. I'm not sure what happened there, but I had drawn out colored lines in here to make it easier to look at this. But <laughs> commonly used transmission lines. This came from the ARRL Antenna Book, 23rd edition, Chapter 23, Table 1. If we look at the top two coaxial lines there, we got two different RG8 entries there. The first one is 50 ohms. And if you look out under dielectric type, FPE, that's foam polyethylene. The velocity factor is 82. A capacitance per foot, uh, we'll, we'll just skip over that in the outer diameter and all of that. Uh, 600 volts RMS. That's the maximum voltage before it could break down. You could put 600 volts on that line. And the loss in dB at 100 feet at 100 megahertz is 1.5 dB. Hmm. All right, look at the other RG8, the second one there. It's 52 ohms, and we're talking about a, a solid polyethylene dielectric here. The velocity factor is slower. It's 66 and that's as we discussed earlier because the foam has air bubbles in there. Mm -hmm. The solid dielectric is a lot more dense and that lowers the velocity factor. Maximum breakdown voltage, though, is 3,700 volts, way more. Wow, it's a huge difference. Yep, quite a difference. Uh, the loss, though, uh, 100 feet at 100 megahertz, 1.9. So between those two different choices of line there, there's some different reasons as to which you would want to pick out. You would think, well, I'd be better off with the uh, RG8 that's foam filled because it's lower loss and it has a higher velocity factor, but the breakdown voltage is lower. That means it couldn't run as much power on it, but it would have lower loss. Mm -hmm. So I might, depending on the application, I might choose the second choice there that the solid dielectric, because it's got 3,700 volts of uh, breakdown. But I'm going to have a little loss because I chose that. So let's look on down to the parallel lines. And we were talking a moment ago, we had some pictures of them there. The twin lead is 300 ohms. Velocity factor for it is 80. It is a solid dielectric polyethylene. The breakdown voltage, RMS, is 
8,000 volts, which is higher. Of course, the twin leads, the two conductors, are farther apart than they would be in a piece of RG8. Be one factor that would increase the breakdown voltage. The loss, though, is uh, better. At 100 megahertz, 100 foot is 1.1 dB. Ladder line, 450 ohms. Velocity factor, 91. It can go 10,000 volts before it breaks down. And look at that loss, man, only 0.3. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that uh, ladder line would be good at 100 megahertz, but apparently, uh, yeah, yeah it may be. Um, and the lines are, are farther apart. The two conductors are farther apart than they are in the coax or in the twin lead. So 10,000 volts. And then the open wire line, 600 ohms, 95 to 99 is the velocity factor range. 12,000 volts. They say it's no dielectric type. Uh, basically not because it's just uh, space insulators ever so far. 0.2 dB loss at 100 megahertz. So that's just some um, statistics there on different types of transmission lines. Kind of interesting. That cable TV line, it's, pr it's really low loss. Uh, yes, and that's what I'm using for my uh, dual band setup here. I don't have 75 ohms, though. I have 50 ohms. It's essentially the same cable, but it's going to be different because it's 50. Got the aluminum inside? Yeah. Really? Well, well, it's aluminum jacket. The center conductor is copper-clad aluminum. Which of the following is a significant difference between foam dielectric coaxial cable and solid dielectric cable, assuming all other parameters are the same? A, foam dielectric has lower safe operating voltage limits. B, foam dielectric has lower loss per unit of length. C, foam dielectric has higher velocity factor. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Let me look at this again. Which of the following is a significant difference between foam dielectric and solid dielectric, assuming all other parameters are the same? A, foam dielectric has a lower safe operating voltage limits. That is true. We just looked at that chart. Foam's going to arc yeah. over at a lower voltage. B, foam dielectric has lower loss per unit of length, and that's true, too. According to that chart, you know, there was less loss on the foam. C, foam dielectric has higher velocity factor, and that was true. Be sure being agreeable. I am. It, it kind of helped to have the cheat sheet there, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> it did. So I'm going to say it's D. All of these choices are correct. And that's what everybody, well, most everybody in the chat room is saying. And Nigel's saying he has a mug of tea. And Nigel, I didn't have a chance to brew me a spot of tea tonight before the show. But let's see if that's the right answer. Yeah, it is. What is the approximate physical length of a foam polyethylene dielectric coaxial transmission line that is electrically one quarter wavelength long at 7.1 megahertz a 10.4 meters b 8.3 meters c 6.9 meters or d 5.2 meters okay 300 divided by 7.2 frequency in megahertz yep and it was foam, so times 0.8. Velocity factor. And divide that by 4. 0.3. B. B. Chat room, mm, they're mixed on this one. I'm going to go with well, you. Well, I might be mixed too, but I think it's B. I'm going to say B. We could both be wrong. Fortunately, though. The maths don't lie. That sounds like something Peter would say. The maths? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. What impedance... I'm glad you got this one. What impedance does a one-eighth wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? A, mm. capacitive reactance... 
B, the same as the characteristic impedance of the line. Or C, the inductive reactance. Or D, zero. I have no idea on this one. What it, yeah, we didn't talk about eighth wave length transmission well, lines. What impedance does a one-eighth wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? All right, I'm going to... I'm going to say it's not B. It's not going to be the characteristic impedance of the line. No. Nope. I don't think it's zero. So that leaves me with the choice of capacitive reactants and inductive reactants. Hmm. I'm just going to take a stab and say it's inductive reactant C. Chat room, a little mixed on this one, too. Yeah, it's kind of a tough one. Yeah. I don't really know. I think I if it were me, I would have guessed A, but I don't know what the answer is. Well, let's see what the answer is. Yeah, there's mixed on it. Okay. It is C, inductive reactants. Can I tell you why? Yes. No, I can't. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not sure why. Been, it would have been decent of you to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would have to do a little more studying than I did to be able to answer exactly why, but uh, it is inductive. So with that in mind, I got one for you. Okay. What impedance does a one-eighth wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? A, the same as the characteristic impedance of the line. B, an inductive reactance. C, a capacitive reactance. Or D, infinite. Uh, impedance is a one-eighth wavelength transmission line present to... When the line is open. Well, since yours was inductive, I'm going to go with C, capacitive reactants. Okay. I, I like your logic there. Well, I think your I mean, answer was kind of, the, <laughs> the, your question was kind of the opposite of mine. But pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, like, I like your reasoning that. Looks like they're leaning toward C over in the chat room. Oh, yeah. All the cool people are picking C. C. And it is. All right. We got a couple more to go. All right. What impedance does a quarter wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? The same as the characteristic impedance of the line? B. The same as the input impedance to the generator. C, very high impedance. Or D, very low impedance. What impedance does a quarter wave transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end? All right, I know on a half wave transmission line, the impedance repeats every half wavelength. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be the same as the input impedance of the generator because we're talking about a quarter wave, not a, a half wavelength. All right, and I think on a quarter wavelength, an odd multiple of a quarter wavelength transmission line, it reverses. I believe that is what we said. And it's just a single one quarter wavelength. So that is an odd multiple. So let's see. If it's open at the far end, then I'm going to say it's a very low impedance at the generator end. Because it's a very high impedance at the other. Present, presents to the generator. Yep. The line's open at the far end. 
Yep, so if it's open at the far end, knowing that it reverses every uh, odd multiple of a quarter wave length, I'm going to say it's right to the opposite. It's a very low impedance. Uh, chat room. Wow. They're saying That's D. It's kind of. What do you say? I'm saying it's kind of giving me a headache. Yeah. It's too much consent, too much ciphering. So it will make you think. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I would have thought uh, the opposite one, but I don't know. I really don't know, obviously. Okay. Very low impedance. Let me see if I've got that texture again. If a transmission line is an odd multiple of a quarter wavelength long, which it is because it's just one quarter wavelength here, the impedance at one end is the opposite of the other end. So if it's open at the far end, then it's got to be almost or practically shorted at the other end of it. So, very low impedance. What impedance does a quarter wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is shorted at the far end? A, a very high impedance. B, very low impedance. C, the same as the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Or D, the same as the generator output impedance. Presents to the generator short at the far end. It's quarter wavelength. I think yours was low, wasn't it? So it's going to go with high impedance. And why do you think it's high? Because it's opposite of yours. That's not Short is an open. You, unless you were looking at my paper, you wouldn't know that. That is true. Because um, the other reason you said was? Well, it's, uh, it's a quarter wavelength mm -hmm. to the generator when the line is shorted. So it's shorted. That would be low, but it's but it flips, right? So, yep. So it's high. You're right. Yeah, I was just wondering if you knew why. You yeah, were right. that's why. Yeah. Chat room, everybody's saying A. A. Is that like a Canadian A or a Fonzie? It's a Fonzie. A? Fonzie. Okay. No offense, Mike. This kind. A. Yeah. All right. That is all the questions for the night. What do you say we take a quick break, come back, visit with the chat room for a moment, and then uh, call it a lucky night? Okay. Talking about the uh, thumbs up, I saw a uh, something on the Internet, so you know it's true, mm -hmm. that I think it was, it wasn't the millennials. What was the next ones they call them, the Gen Zs or whatever? The next okay. generation. Anyway, yeah. that, they think, that they think that that's... Uh, to them, they think it's uh, like basically like a middle finger. Well, they're wrong. Like, and it's, I, I know they're wrong. <laughs> it's um, sort of the opposite of that. It well, it's like a quarter wavelength. It's opposite of that. Uh, I'm gonna get my butt whooped then, because when I'm in a restaurant where I don't really speak the same language as the <laughs> servers, and they ask me how is it, I just give them a thumbs up. <laughs> But, I mean, it, now, wait a minute. That can't be right. I don't right. know if it's true. It was on the Internet, though. Because if you do a like on a video, you're doing a thumbs up. I know. Up. That's actually what it was talking about. What? They were talking about the, uh, well, actually, they're talking about the emojis when you text somebody. Yeah. And they say something, you give them a thumbs up, and they, like, they think it's, some of them think it's like uh, basically telling them off. So that's like, like when you were saying, uh, he's bad. You're really saying he's good. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Something like that. One decade you can be cool, the next you can be hot. You know, it's just, I don't know. The fire. Things flip around. We'll be right back. Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest-running video podcast, 
AmateurLogic.tv with hosts George Thomas, Tommy Martin, Emil Diodene, and Mike Morneau. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier and oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh. Huh. That explains a lot. Now we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. What ammunition do you use in there? Uh, actually, you can use black powder. You can use um, <laughs> WD-40. You can use you know anything combustible. Um, you just have to use the right quantity. And uh, we assume no responsibility for mishaps. <laughs> Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. I particularly like that last one there, $29.99. You can get a 50 foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> 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 Do not get cord wet. Now, most of these J-poles are built with metal elements of tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. <laughs> <laughs> Last show, I'm going to sing the theme song. Because if I sit, do it before, you're not going to let me come back. Well, you said we'll get counseled after that. Probably. <laughs> I wouldn't well, doubt it. Well, let's see what's been going over in the chat room. Tom says, for a real cheap trap at field day, put two open one-quarter wavelength cables on the band you want to kill, they should be separated by one quarter wavelength, so at least one isn't at a minimum node. You know, that could have saved us a bunch of money, Tom, if we had known that a few years back, because we bought filters. Hmm. You remember those bandpass filters we got? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was just thinking about... Uh... The stub yeah. that you cut for the repeater? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, exactly. See? Yep. Did you see the bulb go up, light up up there? Hear the ding? I thought I, I, thought I heard a buzz, but it was a <laughs> ding. <huh? laughs> no, that's, no, no yeah. buzzers tonight, man. That is Maybe. a good, you know, good idea. I have not thought about that, but yeah, that would be a cheap way to do it. We'll have to uh, mention that to email. That actually would be a uh, a pretty cool segment idea. Yeah. We've done. Well, we were just trying to block a single frequency. But or pass a sing, uh, certain frequency. Yeah, we, we need to pull out the spectrum analyzer and play with some stubs again one day. Yeah. That was fun. Happy loop year. Yep. Save three, everybody. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>